distinguished guests, fellow companions in the profession of arms. I don't know if uh, Wing Commander Fredrickson introduced me by my uh, nickname of Dickie, uh, but uh, that's what I'm commonly known as, and it's probably because of my uh, uncanny resemblance to this guy, uh, sorry, to this guy. I'm honoured uh, today to speak at this Sir James Rowland conference. Uh, I met Sir James on a number of occasions when I was in LAC on duty at Government House in Sydney. As junior staff, we were provided uh, with a few plates of sandwiches and jugs of beer after the investitures, and we often found ourselves joined by Sir James, who said he'd rather uh, come around the back with us, take his jacket off and have a few beers with the raffies than be stuck inside the mansion. My presentation today is about the foundations of Australian aviation culture. To investigate this topic, <clears throat> I seek to answer the question, what does it mean to be an Australian airman? I'll start by proposing that we are members of the profession of arms who operate in the air domain as a military service. We do so jointly with our sibling services to provide air power effects on behalf of the nation. So, let me unpack the three elements of my proposition. The profession of arms, operating in the air domain, and being part of a military service. Australian-born but British-serving Lieutenant General Sir John Hackett argued that the function of the profession of arms is the ordered application of force in the resolution of a social problem. Somewhat imaginatively, Hackett declared that there is an element of religious vocation in those who serve in the military, and that in certain times and places, the calling resembles a priesthood. For us, Hackett, who was writing in the 1960s, might be a little hopeful in his assessment. Nonetheless, military service demands a unique obligation from its adherents. We must be prepared on behalf of the nation to take the life of another human. Members of the profession of arms must perform a role that is contrary to the endeavours of the rest of civilised society, and they therefore form a distinct community within that society. In fact, since the dawn of civilization, societies have set apart two groups, the shamans, that is the seers, the healers, those with special religious or medical knowledge, and the warriors. The warriors are the only ones generally granted authority to take human life deliberately and on behalf of society. Armed police forces can only kill in self-protection or the protection of others. Any lethal actions they commit cannot be deliberate or pre-planned. The power invested in the military is an awesome one that also has the potential uh, to threaten the society that sanctions it. As a result, warriors are held to a higher account than the general community. In fact, they are the essence of paradox. They must be lethal but constrained, aggressive but disciplined, self-aware but dispassionate, courageous but not reckless, ruthless but compassionate. They must value human life but be prepared to take it. Civilised society expects the human ideal in the profession of arms. So, what sets aside airmen in that ancient and noble profession? Since the beginning of human conflict, the ability to seize the high ground, either to observe the enemy or to use gravity to advantage, has provided considerable combat superiority. High and close to the action is ideal, but rarely afforded. To overcome gravity and view the battle below directly, bird-like, required technology beyond the reach of human ingenuity. That was until the invention of the manned hot air balloon by the Montgolfier brothers in 1783. The first use of their invention in war followed soon after, during the Battle of Fleurus in Flanders in 1794. It provided an intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance role for French General Jourdain, 
uh, and his forces and helped them to prevail over the opposing Austrian and Dutch forces. The ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus said that war is common to all and that all things come from such strife. And we can argue that conflict has been the driver of so much technology over the millennia. Take radar, jet engines, GPS and the internet as now ubiquitous examples in living memory. However, journalist Wendy Hu suggests that aircraft exemplify the history of technology as a double-edged sword one that advances and modernises a society while also increasingly threatening its eradication. All technology relies on the inherent properties of the materials used and the way that we use them. In aviation, the limits of those materials can be reached due to environmental factors or human actions. So the fragility of aviation requires special characteristics of those who would engage with it. Those who can accept and manage the risks display the attitude of air-mindedness, be they aircrew in military aircraft or passengers on commercial airliners. Air-mindedness, not to be confused with airmanship, which is the skills, judgment and discipline required to operate aircraft safely and effectively, is a term first coined by Sir Samuel Hoare, the British Secretary of State for Air in about 1926. The Oxford English Dictionary defines air-mindedness simply as interest in and enthusiasm for the use and development of aircraft. The concept really began with those for whom aviation was a possibility, that is the wealthy and those who had served in the aviation services of the Great War. In 1929, journalist and aviation enthusiast Stella Wolfe Murray exemplified air-mindedness when she said, even if she has never flown, it is enough that she should want to and that she should gaze upward with longing when she sees an aeroplane in flight and that she studies the question enough to develop the air-mind. As aviation gradually became commonplace, the civil community became unconsciously air-minded and the term disappeared from general usage in the 1950s. Notwithstanding the observation by historian Geoffrey Blaney in his seminal 1966 work, The Tyranny of Distance, that aviation is a defining feature of the national character of Australia and that Australians became more accustomed to flying than the people of probably any other country. However, air-mindedness has remained an enduring aspect of military aviation. Prophetically, the proprietor of Britain's Daily Mail, Lord Northcliffe, said in 1905 that the day the English Channel is crossed by air, England is no longer an island. Of course, that geographic reality had determined that the defence of Britain was, in the first instance, a maritime one. Frenchman Louis Blériot changed that in 1909 when he flew an aircraft of his own manufacture from Calais in France to Dover, England. On the day after Blériot's crossing, the Daily Mail said that they are not mere dreamers who hold that the time is at hand when air power will be an even more important thing than sea power. Of course, the military potential of powered flight was realised by European military authorities long before 1909. Major Fullerton of the Royal Engineers gave a presentation at the inaugural Congress of Engineers in Ch uh, International Congress of Engineers in Chicago in August 1893, entitled Some Remarks on Aerial Warfare. He concluded his talk with the remark that wars in the future will probably commence with severe fighting in the air, the victor following up his successes with sea and land battles aided by airships. He added that warfare by sea and land will only be possible when a nation has the command of the air. And note that he was saying this 10 years before the Wright brothers flew. Italian air power theorist Guilio Due wrote in 1909 that at present we are fully conscious of the importance of the sea. In the near future, 
it will be no less vital to achieve the same kind of supremacy in the air. Before long, Italian forces dropped grenades from observation dirigibles on Arab and Turkish forces east of Tripoli during the Italo-Turkish War in October 1911. The following month, Lieutenant Guilio Gavotti dropped grenades on Turkish encampments from his Torb aircraft. Air-mindedness in the military context had come of age before the Great War. Official numbers vary, but by August 1914, a mere five years after Blériot's crossing, Germany had about 246 aircraft in military service. France had 160. The Russians had some 260 aircraft of varying standards, while the British had 113. Not all of these were suitable for frontline work, of course. Australia had five, but that's another story. The aircrew and maintainers of those aircraft spawned the military aviation culture with a firm sense of air-mindedness. A century later, one modern-day air power theorist defines air-mindedness as a global strategic mindset providing perspective through which the battle space is not constrained by geography, distance, location or time. United States Air Force official doctrine adds that air power is not situation or platform specific and is applied dynamically. But are airmen intrinsically different from sailors? RAF doctrine argues that there are cultural differences between the three Australian services and that the differentiation lies in the different technologies used and therefore the way they fight in combat environments as well as individual histories and heritage they maintain. Major General Peter Haddad summed up this situation very well. After serving in the Joint Environment for many years and while Commander Joint Logistics Command, he said that he'd finally worked out the difference between the three services. The Army, he said, does a dangerous job that nobody really wants to do. And the best way to do it safely is to get in, do it and get out. This relies on leadership, he said. I might argue that it's better described as strong command. For the Navy, every sailor's job contributes to the ship's mission and survivability. And if one fails, they all go down with the ship. So the Navy relies on teamwork. The General said that it took him the longest to understand the Air Force. He finally determined that operating in the air requires independent thought that constantly rechecks assumptions and questions decisions. If General Haddad is right, this might explain some of the cultural rub points between the services. However, without using the word, he was recognising quite simply that airmen are air-minded. In case you can't read the fine print at the bottom, I'll just blow that up for you. <laughs> Airmen are proud to be different from sailors and soldiers. However, they recognise and respect the skills and knowledge of others, and they recognise their own limitations. They know what air-mindedness brings to the joint environment. This ranges from the tactical application of air power in joint operations with maritime and land forces to the strategic options afforded by air power in national posturing to shape, deter and coerce. Airmen therefore epitomise modern day air mindedness. Now I began with the proposition that as Australian airmen we are members of the profession of arms who operate in the air domain as a service. So finally, I wish to explore the nature of being part of that service. In other words, I want to ask what sets Australian airmen apart? Life as an Australian airman is different from life in the general community. It has always offered experiences and challenges not faced by most others. This has generated a unique culture and what psychologists call a sense of community. Psychologists David McMillan and David Chavis propose, propose that a sense of community is a feeling that members have of belonging, a feeling that members matter to one another and to the group, and 
a shared faith that members' needs will be met through their commitment to be together. In the case of the Air Force community, that commitment to be together is more of a psychological and emotional one than a physical one, of course. This sense of community is a critical part of Australian aviation culture, but culture is also much more than that. Culture is a way of life that comprises values, assumptions, knowledge, symbols, social behaviours and customs. Actually, you might have heard it said that the Navy has customs, the Army has traditions and the Air Force has bad habits. This serves to reinforce that culture is passed on generationally and is accepted generally without thinking. Military aviation culture relies on three elements, technology, knowledge and people. The inherent and enduring air-mindedness of, air, of airmen means that they are willing to trust the technology that allows them to form their role. This, however, relies on technical and professional mastery at all levels. As a part of that mastery, we design systems to ensure safety, and Sir Angus outlined those in some detail in, in his talk. But those systems are worthless without the values that airmen share. So much for the theory, but how does this culture manifest itself in Australian military aviation? And now I'll just give you some examples. It manifests itself when I had a conversation with a uh, Super Hornet pilot who told me that he was not looking forward to his flight back home from the Middle East. And when I asked him why, he said that he absolutely trusts the work of the maintainers in his squadron. And when they declare his jet ready, he has no question that it is. However, uh, he was not as assured on his contracted passenger jet. Our culture is evident in the language that we use. In the case of the Air Force, we're an organisation of nux and spits, black-handers and back-enders, doggies and drain sniffers, techos and trash haulers, gunnies and geeks, fishheads and jaffers. And of course, only one of us, uh, only half of us has a real name. I've recently deployed with Gux and Gam, and I'm sure everyone knows Fritz and Blitz and uh, Chippy Chapo and Chipper. Uh, of course, uh, our culture is alive when we don't see our colleagues for a long time because of postings, but we pick up the conversation again virtually where we left it off three years earlier. Then our partners do the same at the barbecue the next weekend. The sense of community comes to the fore in cases like this air woman, an Air Force spouse who joined an Air Force related Facebook group a couple of weeks ago. Our culture plays out in familial connections, such as those of the uh, case of my colleague Air Commodore Noddy Sawade, who's, uh, I can't remember, his three, four or five children are serving in the ADF, and to whom I once suggested we could save a fortune by cancelling uh, the recruiting program and just continuing with the breeding program. It's there when we look out for one another, today when our gender, religion, ethnic heritage and sexual orientation makes no difference to those we work with, allowing our technical and professional mastery to carry us above all else. It wasn't always like this, of course. It's evident when we come together after tragedy, particularly when one of our number dies in the service of the nation through military aviation, and equally so when we never forget, commemorating their life and sacrifice in gestures, even as simple as toasting absent friends during a dinner. So I'll wrap up now, and with a nod to Charles Merriam, suggest to you that what sets us apart is that the Air Force's victories are our victories and that we can rightly celebrate them. However, all of the Air Force's mistakes and sorrows are also ours and we must reflect on them and learn from them. All of the greats of the service, past and present, are our companions in the bond as airmen. And although humble as individuals, we are members of an illustrious group as Australian airmen. Thank you.